women are meant to be loved, not to be understood, said Oscar Wilde. When we question whether loving women was his field of expertise, but there is no doubt that Wilde loved and understood his Shakespeare, whom we celebrate this year as it is 400 years since he died. One of Wilde's stories published in the collection from which I took the opening quote is called The Portrait of Master W.H. A few lines from this novel will serve as a backdrop to my own story. This is the portrait of Master W.H., said Erskine with a sad smile. It might have been a chance effect of light, but it seemed to me that his eyes were swimming with tears. Master W.H., I said. Who was Master W.H.? Don't you remember, he answered. Look at the book on which his hand is resting. I see there is some writing there, but I cannot make it out. Take this magnifying glass and try, said Erskine, with the same sad smile still playing about his mouth. I took the glass and, moving the lamp a little nearer, I began to spell out the crabbed 16th century handwriting to the only begetter of these ensuing Sonnets. Good heavens, I cried, is this Shakespeare's Master W.H.? This novel illustrates the grim destiny that may befall those who pursue these enigmatic initials. Still, I think it's about time someone would solve this riddle once and for all. I will now tell you what happened when I gave it a try. Master W.H. is the begetter of Shakespeare's sonnets we read, whatever that could mean. The book is dated 1609, and these letters have since represented a mystery. They are just as confusing as if they were Greek. I never should have thought that I would be lecturing about Shakespeare when I began my study of W.D. Gann, a Wall Street trader, but this legendary man's encouragement to look for secret messages in a novel he wrote has since led to my participation in TV series and a film and the publishing of two books, not on trading, but on the Shakespeare mystery. Encouraged by a Curious comment made by Mr. Gann, I knew I had to look into the old rumors that there'd be ciphers in Shakespeare. And soon <laughs> I found myself pondering the mysterious Master W.H. Experts seem to agree that W.H. must have been a real person, which seems quite obvious. They could say that W.S. Is, is really a type of W.S. William Shakespeare. I found this solution hard to accept given the transparency of the text, and William himself is another dubious favorite. More promising, though, were three other candidates. First among these is William Herbert, to whom the first folio was dedicated. The first folio is the first compiled edition of Shakespeare plays. William Herbert and W.H., perfect match. The problem with his candidacy is that he was a nobleman and the title master would be thought offensive. The second top-notch contender could well be the man to whom the first part of the sonnets were written, the Earl of Southampton. Also he, a nobleman. His masculine beauty was legendary, and the two first Shakespeare publications from the early 1590s were dedicated to him. His name, Henry Risley. So also here, we need a typo to accept that. Thirdly, Oscar Wilde's protagonists in the novel, they subscribe to a less known idea that there existed a boy actor called Willie Hughes, with whom Shakespeare was madly in love. <laughs> the only problem is that uh, despite centuries of arduous archive search, no proof of any real Willie Hughes has come to light. If only Oscar Wilde had known that his own initials reveal the mystery. So many candidates and so few back facts to back them up. How frustrating is that? Could the problem be that the fundamental premise is wrong? I mean, how can we know with any certainty which person was meant from just two letters? I therefore decided to drop the search for a person, and instead I began to play with the idea that master could mean master key or something along that line. Then things began to happen. When you look at this odd page, it may come as little surprise 
that I, being on a cipher, and thought I could be looking at a cryptogram. On brief inspection, I noticed the triangular shape. In fact, I see two of them, and the word by stands alone in the middle. Why would it be so, I thought. I felt like counting letters. I found that the upper triangle consists of 81 capital letters. 81 is 9 squared, or 9 by 9. Hmm, interesting. The lower triangle, including TT, has 64 letters. 64 is 8 by 8. Wow, did this explain the by in the middle? Thankfully, I had carried several heavy cartons stuffed with a complete Oxford English Dictionary, 17 large volumes, into my office for this kind of situation. It assured me that Englishmen did use by in the meaning of squaring all the way back to the 13th century. So, these two triangles and their square numbers, I found that a promising start, I mean, this is a geometrical pursuit, made me think of Pythagoras. Remember him? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. His theorem deals with triangles, specifically those with a right angle. And Pythagoras produces an astonishing outcome to which I shall soon return. First, I need to tell you what happened when I looked at the numbering of these 154 poems. Yes, a sonnet is just that, a special kind of poem consisting of 14 lines, and the rhythm has five beats per line. So, 14 and five. This so-called iambic pentameter that Shakespeare brought to perfection beats like the heart, shall I compare the two a summer's day. Leafing through the pages, I looked for anomalies. If something is hidden and is meant to be found, an error can typically be its signpost. I made note of three sonnets that for seemingly no good reason have dots added to their number. These were sonnets 9, 18, and 122. Could these dots be related to the alphabet, I thought? Probably because the two first dots are early in the poem cycle. Inspection of sonnets 1 to 24, 24 because Shakespeare's alphabet had 24 letters, revealed that two of them have an opening letter where the sonnet number is matching this opening letter's position number in the alphabet. By this I mean for a match sonnet 1, We'll begin with A, sonnet 2 with B, etc. Statistically, I should find one match, but there are two. Not downright impressive, but when I tell you that it is sonnet 9 that begins with an I and sonnet 18 that begins with an S, we even see 18 just above an S, and that these two matches are marked by the two first dots, the odds skyrocket. That felt Great. <laughs> but what about the third dot? Inspection of sonnet 122 revealed that the relationship between the dot and the opening letter was not an accident. You see, this sonnet features an extraordinary typo. Its opening letter, a T, has been made into a letter pair, T, T, mind you. This is the only typo of its kind in the whole cycle of sonnets, and I found it impossible that this was just a freak accident. Just look how words two and three are separated by double commas inside T, T. New questions, T, T, and 122. What could be the connection? I knew I'd seen T, T somewhere. In fact, T, T is prominently placed on the dedicatory page. It is even signed TT and acrostically, which means to read the first letter of each line, we also see TT. Could this be an invitation to read this dotty dedication as an acrostic? To make a long story short, the sum when adding the acrostic letters from the first to the third, T is 122, the number of the TT sonnet through the Larsen of the University of Tromsø deserves credit for this observation. Now, back to Pythagoras. I said he produces magic. What I did was to 
take these triangles and add their numbers, the number of letters together, as if they were the squared shorter sides of a right angle triangle. Looking for the hypotenuse number, which would be 145. And 145 is within the range of sonnets. There should therefore be a sonnet that has this hypotenuse number. Ideally, this sonnet should feature some quality that relates to the idea of a square. I will show you what I found. Sonnet 145 is considered to be the slightest among Shakespeare's sonnets. Why this stigma? It's because this sonnet, with its perfectly sonnet descriptive number, 14 lines and five beats, violates something fundamental, the rule of five beats. Those lips that love's own hand did make four if anything would make me think of a square, it is number four. Uh, square comes from X quadrant, from four. Could this be the reason why this freak sonnet was placed here? Let me tell you about its contents. A repeated statement is, I hate. It is found three times, the triangular number. The last time it occurs, the meaning is reversed by the relieving negation, not you. I hate. Mm. I is letter number nine, square root of 81, number of letters in the upper triangle. Hate begins with H, letter number eight, <laughs> square root of 64, lower triangle. Wow, 81, 64, 9, 8, I, H. But um, in the alphabet, I follows H. And, and in the last line, the meaning of I is reversed. Could that be a clue, perhaps? Both the writer of the sonnets and Oscar Wilde were erotically attracted to men. This is referred to as the Greek vice, as we learned earlier today, from its commonplace in antiquity. Some have said that, that the relationship between WH and Shakespeare was more Greek than anything else. Ironically, this turned out to be the key. Relief, as we see it in Son 145, is given as reversed hate, literally eta h. This is Greek. The letter h is a Greek letter called eta, one of the two Greek e's. Thereby follows that the w is an omega, one of the two Greek o's. You see it in the lower right hand corner. So we have O and W, the Oscar Wilde's initials. And the, the lowercase e, that looks like our lowercase n. Here is 145 as it is printed in the sonnets. Just above own, one of the few words that combine these letters, O and omega, lowercase eta and e, 14 and five O's and E's respective number in the alphabet. This cipher method to interchange Greek with Latin letters is also known in antiquity as demonstrated by Julius Caesar and Cicero. Some time later, I discovered a letter draft resting in a library in Canterbury, in which a prominent contemporary of Shakespeare writes English with Greek characters. Here is a facsimile of the word sometimes written with a W as the O. And this is a key that will open doors and may lead to a great discovery as we return to the acrostic. The letters following TT are MAP, here shown horizontally. MAP, of course, signify a map. The master WH key enabled me to read the dedications combined acrostic and acronym, adding to constellations to my map. These are Botus and the Wayne, neighbors in the sky. Shakespeare in the first folio was called the sweet swan of Avon and was hailed as the star of poets in the constellation by that name. And the greatest star in the heavenly swan is Deneb. Deneb and Arcturus, also known as Botus, squarely join in the middle of the wane, create a three to four ratio Pythagorean triangle in the heavens. And 
the heavens and the earth share the same coordinate system. So a point there is a point there. And I was shocked to see that the star that signifies Shakespeare, according to the first folio, is painted onto the coast of Nova Scotia on, that, on an earth map from the 16th century. We have Cauda Signi, the tail of the swan. And this is curious because Shakespeare's swan song has the initials TT, the tempest. Its action takes place on an island beyond the seas. And here is where I found the greatest surprise so far. You see, the opening word of the tempest, which is the first spoken word in the whole first folio, has the most curious spelling. It has been made into a unique word that is a blend of my maps to constellations. Botus Wain. Then follow here, Master W H. Could this cryptographic exercise be the tip of an encoded iceberg drifting towards the coast of Nova Scotia, a part of the world that was being colonized by the British at this time in history? One of the Nova Scotian islands is famous for something. It has the same latitude as Deneb, and it is famed for its treasure. It's alleged treasure. It has been hunted, not for 122 like the sonnet, but for 221 years this year, has this treasure been hunted, and still is. And since the 1930s, for different reasons, the long lost Shakespearean manuscripts have been thought to be part of the treasure. So, there's another story. <laughs> but for me, tonight, just as it was for Hamlet, the rest is silence. Thank you.